Black Church family. How are you guys doing tonight? Let's stand together. This is the Lord's day. We're going to worship him together. We're going to praise our King. Let's put our hands together.
reason. You've always been good. You've always been kind. How we love you and praise you, Lord. Supply every need.
paid the greatest price for us, Jesus. You have everything. We lay it all down before you. We give you praise. We love you. We honor you today in your wonderful name. Amen. Amen. You can have a seat. We come to the time of communion, and the name of the song that we just sang is Agnus Dei, which has been referenced before communion for ages. And it's referencing back to John when he sees Jesus. He says, look, the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. It's an amazing statement for John the Baptist. Because we see lambs today as petting zoo or something like that. But in the context of the time, it was the most purest sacrifice, unblemished for sins of a Hebrew. This was amazing. So we look at this and we say, okay, well, how, what does this have to do with communion? It has everything to do with communion because we celebrate this every week because it's the blood and the flesh of the lamb, the perfect sacrifice for ages, for all of us. And that's what this is about. So if you will take the elements and you're more than welcome if you believe in Jesus Christ to take these elements. But if you'll take the bread and look back in the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took the bread and he said, this is my body, take this, do this in remembrance of me. So church, let us remember the same way he took the cup and he gave thanks and he said this is my blood that establishes a new covenant do this in remembrance of me so church remember pray Father God we we praise you and thank you for the lamb the perfect gift of your son Jesus Christ to die on the cross for our sins Lord we praise you and thank you Lord for this time to remember that and Lord for us to take it physically into our bodies not only for our physical self but our spiritual self our souls God Lord, open our minds and open our hearts to hear your word today, Lord. And speak to us the only way that you know how. In Jesus Christ's name, amen. Well, welcome. My name is David Brown. I get to be the executive pastor here at New Life. If you are new here, we'd love to connect with you. Uh, how we can do that is there's a card in the seat back in front of you. You can take that card, fill that out, put in the receptacles in the back, or drop it off at the welcome desk at the back. We've got a free gift for you for a new guest. And uh, if you haven't received one, we've got one for you as well. Um, if you um, also can get online and uh, scan that QR code in front of you, and you can sign up that way. It takes you to our app. Our app is a great place to look at what's going on in this church. We're super excited about our 50th anniversary, our 50th celebration. It's going to be awesome. Uh, we're going to meet together as one church. It's going to be an uh, amazing time. We will have sermon. We'll have worship music. We'll have a stage set out there. It is going to be at Loch Lomond. It's going to be awesome. It's going to be the 29th, September the 29th, 
at 10 o'clock. Um, afterwards, we're going to have jump houses and inflatables for all adults as well as children. Everybody's like adults? Yeah, I said adults. Um, we're going to have a softball tournament, and you got to sign up for that. You can do that online as well. Um, it's going to be awesome. It's going to be co-ed, so it'll be, uh, it'll be really cool. And we'll have food trucks out there. Bring picnics. Bring your lawn chair. Bring all the things that you need. But uh, it's going to be an awesome time, and we pray that it's not raining like it is today. So uh, we pray that it's not going to be raining. So... Um, hey, we are also a church that goes, and we support our GO initiatives by supporting global and local missions. Uh, this is poor, probably more of a local mission for us, but it's Ozark Christian College. We have a lot of people on staff from Ozark. We have some kids from here that go to Ozark. It is an awesome college, and we'd like for you to know a little bit more about that. And afterwards, we got our favorite thing is baptisms after this. So you guys, listen up. I'm just one. 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 Well, church, I'd like to introduce you to Shar Tamayo, and she comes here today to be at baptized. Uh, Shar, will you repeat your, repeat your good confession of faith? I believe. I believe. That Jesus is the Christ. That Jesus is the Christ. The Son of the living God. The Son of the living God. I take him. And I take him. As my personal Lord and Savior. As my personal Lord and Savior. Well, Char, if you will step up here. It is my honor to baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Buried in Christ. <laughs> raised to new life. Awesome. Hey, um, uh, before we jump into the Word today, um, there was a letter, an all-church email that went out uh, this afternoon, and um, it went to my junk mail file. And it's a really weird thing to see an email that you send out <laughs> land up in your junk file. And we had some people tell us that, hey, my emails from the church have been going to my junk folder. So here's what I want to tell you. Don't look right now, but uh, when we're done, uh, check for that email that, that was sent out today. And it might, if you don't have it in your inbox, look in your junk mail. We'll figure that out. I'm not sure why that's doing that here lately. But uh, an email went out talking about our upcoming um, elder recommendations and some things happening this fall, some very important information. Definitely want everybody to be aware of that. And so please uh, uh, read that email uh, uh, later on today. It's either in your inbox or it's going to be in your junk mail. It's going to be one of those. But that went out today, and I want to let you guys know about that. We are continuing this uh, line of teaching that we're in right now. We're just simply calling it Go, Life-Changing Community. Um, we have two sermons focused on that, last week and this week. And then next week, um, the series changes significantly um, to Go. And we're going to, I talked a lot about that last week, and uh, I won't say a whole lot about it now. But I just really feel like uh, these next few sermons, off in September and October, are going to be some of the most influential sermons I've ever preached here, uh, church-changing sermons. And I definitely want you guys to be here and commit to, to listening to those and being open to what God might be leading you to. But that starts next week, um, and today we're going to finish this, this second part of this grow part of this series. Last week we talked about um, our walks with the Lord and walking with the Lord with great intentionality. I want this to kind of come back into your mind just a little bit. Um, I talked about how nobody accidentally becomes a mature follower of Jesus. It just doesn't happen that way. Uh, you don't just hope it happens. It takes intentionality. I love what the Apostle Paul wrote to the church in Ephesians chapter 5 when he said in, chapter, in verse 10, find out what pleases the Lord. 
I want you to hear the intentionality in that statement. You got to find out. You got to explore. You got to discover. You don't just trial and error it. You know, so how do you find out? Well, you got to be in God's word. Be in our gathering. Worship the Lord. Remember Christ's sacrifice and communion. Open God's word like we're doing now. Um, be in life group with others. Be in God. All of those things combined helps you discover what pleases the Lord. And King David wrote, we looked at this last week, Psalm 16, 8. He says, I keep my eyes on the Lord always. And with him by my side, I won't be shaken. Do you understand how much intentionality it takes on your part to keep your eyes focused on him, especially in this world with so many distractions, so many things that want to steer your eyes to other things that are not nearly as important as your walk with Jesus. So King David, he's the guy that lived on both sides of that, seasons where his eyes were completely off God and seasons where they were on. And I, I challenged you last week saying, uh, if you've ever gone through a season where your eyes were off the Lord, how well did that work out for you in that season? How well did things go? I would argue probably not that great. So great intentionality it takes to walk with the Lord. And, and, and I hope and pray that some of you considered that last week and made some intentional steps towards that. I, I, some of you, last I talked to Pastor Cody, a number of our life groups at both campuses filled up last week. There's still more out there uh, for you to join. But some of you took that intentional step last week and you joined a life group. And I'm telling you, that may have been one of the most intentional steps for your walk with Jesus and your fellowship with this church that you've ever taken. I, I'm here to tell you through testimony uh, just how much my life group, the people in that life group have meant to my life and what it has meant to my walk with Jesus. And I believe you can have the exact same experience. Also, I want you to know, next week, um, we will be starting back up our, our life group study guides. And if you are new this summer, you may not be aware what that is, but uh, we do what's called a sermon-based life group model. That means all of our life groups are studying the same thing, which is a continuation of what was preached that, that weekend, and, and that study, that conversation goes right into all of our life groups. And to help that process is we create a study guide. And uh, the idea is that you pick up one of these study guides here when you're here for worship. You can also download them um, on the app. And, and you take that and you do that on your own. You dig deeper on your own. And you go into your life group that week prepared to have this discussion. So the life group study guide is the baseline of what keeps that conversation going and that study in your life group. But I also want to tell you this, even if you're not in a life group, I still would like for you to do the study guide. They're still available for you. You can pick up a paper copy or like I said on the app, but, but starting next week at both campuses, there'll be a rack of study guides right by the main entrance. You just grab yours on your way in or on your way out. And that's the baseline study for our life groups. And I'm excited for all of that to kick off uh, next weekend um, here at New Life. And I'm excited for that. Today, I'd like for us to kind of finish up this first part of the conversation on grow and this community by looking at a passage of scripture from Hebrews chapter 10. You got your Bibles? Would you open up to Hebrews chapter 10? We're going to be in a couple verses there, and I'd like for you to just have that on your lap in front of you. Um, it's also going to be on the screen behind me, but I always want to encourage you to have your Bible open, have the Bible app open on your phone, have it right there with you. Um, all the scriptures are listed under the sermon notes in the app. There's a lot of ways to get to this, but I'd like for it to be in front of you. And I'd like for us to start reading together. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 22. And I want you to pay uh, particular attention to the amount of times that the Apostle Paul says this, let us, okay? Pay, pay attention to that phrase, all right? Here we go. Verse 22. Let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and with the full assurance that faith brings, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how we may spur one another along towards love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. Three times in these uh, short verses, the writer of Hebrews, who I also believe to be the apostle Paul, but he's not named as the author, but I believe it is. But the writer of Hebrews three times is challenging the Christians he's writing to 
uh, with these three let us declarations. The first one is found in verse 22. Let us, the church, let us draw near to God. Now, by the time that, I believe Paul wrote this, the church was somewhere about 35 or 40 years old. So he'd been going on for a couple of decades. There was enough time that goes by that false teachers had come in. The, some of these concepts that Jesus taught were being challenged. There were those Christians who were abandoning the faith. And so there's this charge to the church that we need to draw near. Don't, don't, don't pull away from the Lord, but intentionally, let's draw near. So this is concept in the New Testament that every individual Christian draws personally close to the Lord, and collectively, we together as the church all draw near to God. Now, the writer of Hebrews uses some very descriptive language that we're going to talk about here because I believe it will help us as we strive to do the same thing in our lives today. He, he's talking about drawing near, and he's using language that I think would have been very, very clear. He says this. Do you see it in verse 22? sprinkled to cleanse our bodies, washed with pure water. What in the world is he talking about? We, we don't use that kind of language. Like when I'm talking to you about walking with Jesus, I don't say things like, hey, sprinkle yourself with pure water. And you know, it's just not how we talk. But that would have been clearly understood by the earliest of Christians. This language that he's, he's using. Here, here's what he meant by that. Let me explain it to you. Because it would have made sense clearly in that day. These Christians were very familiar with priestly duties. Many of them grew up. They've left the Jewish faith. They, even as Gentiles, some of them have known that, that the Jewish people had, their, their priests had these priestly duties. They had to go through a number of ceremonial washings in order to approach the Lord. There's very specific instructions for the priest. We didn't spend a ton of time with this during our rescued series, but if you go back to the books of Exodus and Leviticus and, and other places, it talks about what these things, how, how the priest had to go to, the, to the, basically a basin of water and he had to cleanse himself before he could approach the Lord and to do his duties. He had to come very clean, very pure. So when he says, Christians, you draw near to God with this idea of cleanliness, they would have had a connection. Just like the priest approaches God clean and pure, as we draw near, he says, let us draw near to God. It's that same idea. I've been over to Jerusalem now for uh, several times, and, and every time I go, I'm amazed at the Western Wall. The Western Wall, a very famous place in, in Jerusalem. Um, this is where the Jews today consider this wall right here like, like the most holy place that you can go physically as a Jewish person. And, and Jewish people want to be here and they'll come here to pray. And the reason why this is such a, a holy place is because this wall has a direct connection to the second temple. This is the same temple that it, it's, just, it's just off picture, but the temple would have been just above them on the Temple Mount. And this is as close as a Jewish person can get to that exact spot. So they go there and they pray. You've probably seen pictures, even if you didn't realize it. People stuff little pieces of paper in the crevices and they leave their prayers there. I've prayed at this wall numerous times. And, um, and, but uh, this is just, is just a very short distance away from where Jesus cleansed the temple. Remember that New Testament? The selling of, of, of sacrifices and a lot of things happened right here. Very, very holy place, if you will for a Jewish person. So if you go there, you're gonna notice some things that all throughout the day, um, out here in this plaza by the Western Wall, there is a place where you can go and wash yourself before you approach the wall. So you approach the wall, obviously, with your head covered, and you cleanse yourself. So what you'll see is these washing stations have a very specific purpose. Um, Jews will go there, and they'll, they'll fill up these, these little buckets. They'll, they'll cleanse their hands, they'll wash them. This is all part of a purification process before prayer commences. So they are to pray at this wall, pour out their hearts to God, and they are to approach this place and this moment with cleanliness, and they understand, I approach the Lord clean. I don't approach the Lord unclean. I approach the Lord clean. There, there's this idea. So these early, early Christians here in Hebrews, they would have understood this idea. Let us draw near to God. 
How do we do that? You don't do that flippantly. You don't do that haphazardly. You don't do that with a bunch of sins walking in with you. You approach God humbly, cleanse yourself, a repentant, humble person. This is the, this is the thing that Paul was trying to communicate. Draw near to God, live holy lives, live clean, pure lives. I could talk about that for a long time. That's a pretty powerful concept that I believe extends all the way to Christians today. And I wonder how many times we approach God very arrogantly. God, give me, give me, give me. Or very flippantly. What's up, Lord? I'll let you interpret how you, but there's instruction. Let us draw near to God. How do you do that? Paul's concern was you do it with a clean, pure heart. And the next, the next let us is found in verse 23. Do you see it in the text? Let us hold to hope. So let us approach God with pure hearts. Now let us not lose this, this hope that we have in front of us. This is, was something very near and dear to the writer of, of Hebrews. There, there was a constant temptation for the Christians back then, I think just like there is for us today, to completely walk away and abandon the faith altogether. You know, for some of them, that would be, I'm going to go back to my old covenant ways. I'm going to go back to the traditions. I'm going to go back to what my parents, I'm going to go back. Others, I'm just going to leave it all together. Some of this was brought on by false teachers that had infiltrated the church all these years later. We read about this all throughout the New Testament. And Paul challenges the church, draw near to God and don't give up. Don't give up on what you believe. And he uses this word specifically, don't give up on the hope. You hold on to that. And this is also a theme through the book of Hebrews. And, and a lot of that hope there is directed to the return of Christ and spending eternity with him. Now I think about what makes a great church. What are some of the attributes uh, of a great church? I believe it's when the people in that congregation obviously love each other, all those things, but they understand that there is a hope that I hold on to and that the Lord will return and one day I will be with him forever in heaven. This is the hope that we have as Christians. And it reminds us that no matter how hard life can get here, it is a temporary place. Compared to eternity, it would never even show up on a map. That there's this hope that we hold in. And one of my primary jobs as your pastor is to periodically uh, remind you, the Lord's coming back. And this is all gonna be great one day. And everything, every wrong that's ever happened to you, every time you've been cheated, every relationship that broke down that wasn't your fault, everything, the Lord will make right one day. Hold on to hope. That's this idea. Something better. Our citizenship is not here. It's elsewhere. It's in heaven with the Lord. And then finally, he gives his third let us a declaration. Let us consider how we can spur one another on to love and good deeds. He goes on to about getting together, encouraging one another until the day the Lord, that day the Lord comes. So I, I read that, and I, I believe this is a direct challenge to today's church. When he says, let us consider. Do you understand what he's saying? He's talking about intentionality here. Let us be on purpose. Let us think think together. Let's brainstorm together. Let's contemplate with one another about how we can do the very things that he is talking about. How can I spur you on to a greater hope, to a deeper love? How can we be better brothers in Christ together? How can I help you through this world while we watch for that day to approach? Now, I read this in, in Hebrews. I read it in, in other parts of the New Testament as well. But here in Hebrews, it seems like there was some fellowship issues. This is addressing some problems going on with the Christians. Um, he's asking them to figure out how they're going to continue to be the church full of love and hope and, and focus on the return of Christ. He even talks about how a number of them had stopped gathering together. You, you've, dis, you, you've pulled back and you're not together anymore. So he, he's talking about some things. It's a serious lack of encouragement among the church here in, in Hebrew. So if you take all of this together, there's a lot jammed into these few verses. I'm just barely touching on them. But I think if you look at verse 22, Paul is saying this to the church. You got to work on your walk with Jesus. Okay. You got to work on it. Got to be intentional. Verse 23, 
He's like, don't give up hope. Jesus is coming back. Verse 24 and 25, don't give up on each other. Don't walk away from your walk with Jesus. Don't walk away from the hope that you have in Jesus' return. And don't walk away from one another. So what seems obvious to me in this text, and I hope it's obvious to you as well, is this concept. We, and I say we, I mean the church, we need each other. Do you agree with that? That we need each other? We absolutely do. And if you take this text seriously, it just spotlights that idea. We absolutely need each other. The earliest Christians needed each other. And I don't think anything has changed in between then and now. Here's something else that, that, that I perceive from my study of the New Testament. I even see this in the Old Testament. That not only do we need each other, but it sure seems to me that God has designed us to need together, to be together. It's not like, yeah, that's a good concept. I think God put it in us to need this. That like there's something that is not complete if we're going through this all on our own. And, and I, I go back all the way to the very beginning um, in the book of Genesis, at the very beginning of creation. Do, do you remember what God said about, about all of it? You know, that if you look at these first couple chapters, God gathered the water into one place and dry ground appeared. And he, he called that dry ground land. And he gathered all the sea water and he called it the sea. And do you remember what he said at the end of that? It is good. You remember that? And then God made the land produce vegetation. So there you get trees, plants, fruits, vegetables, literally all kinds of stuff that pop up. And God said, what about it? That is good. That's good. And then God made the sun, moon, and stars. And that is good. Then God filled the water with all kinds of, of creatures. He, he filled the air with all kinds of winged creatures. And what did he say? It's good. Did the same thing on the land. All the animals and life, they show up and God said, that is good. And then God created man. He put man right in the garden to take care of it. And for the first time, God did not say, that is good. Something, something is not so good. Genesis 2.18 says, the Lord said, it is not good for man to be alone. I really think what, what God is planting the seeds here for us is that we're introduced, I think, to this concept of loneliness. Because it's not good. I think God saw an individual doing all of this without anyone else. That's not a good thing. So God created Eve. And that's where it all fell apart. No, I'm kidding. No, I'm, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm <laughs> kidding. I'm joking. God created Eve and, you know, uh, for a very specific purpose and, and the whole human population doubled in, in just like that. I don't know if you've ever thought about it like this before, but this is my conviction. This is where my study of Scripture leads me. That I believe God put inside of each of us a specific need that only other people can fill. Like there's something in here that will never be fulfilled without somebody else in your life. That's why I think God designed us to need each other. I see that all the way back in the garden. It's one of the main reasons for why marriage makes so much sense. But this need that only other people can fill, I see that it is a much broader conversation than marriage. Way broader. Marriage or no marriage, we still need other people in our lives and great relationships with like-minded followers of Jesus fill this need and helps us grow in our walk with Christ. And I believe that's all by God's design. And that's one of the reasons why I'm a big proponent of life groups here at New Life. So when Paul said to the church, let us consider, let's contemplate, let's think about it, let's brainstorm, let's come up with some ideas about how we can spur one another along to love and good deeds when we consider that here at New Life, life groups seem to make a whole lot of sense. So let's the church draw near to God. Let's hold on to hope. Let's spur one another along. And, and I believe a lot of that can happen. Not the only way, but a lot of that can happen very intentionally in a life group. So 
There's a lot of scripture that talk about these very things. I'm gonna, uh, about how um, our walk with God is deeply impacted by our relationships with other believers. I'm not gonna give you all the scripture references, but let me just rattle these off really fast. All the scripture references that I'm gonna give you, uh, I'm gonna say, are in the app. So if you wanna know what, where these are, you can find them in the app. But listen to how um, our walk with God is deeply impacted by our relationship with others. Here's all scripture. Be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Honor one another above yourselves. Live in harmony with one another. Accept one another. Instruct one another. Greet one another with a holy kiss. I don't know about that one. (laughs) Agree with one another. Serve one another in love. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Do you understand how all of these things don't happen Um, in a vacuum, they happen with other people. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other. Whew. That's a hard one. Speak to one another with psalms, hymns, spiritual songs. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Bear with each other and forgive whatever grievances you have against one another. Teach and admonish one another with all wisdom, encourage one another and build each other up, live in peace with each other, try to be kind to each other and everyone else, spur one another along towards love and good deeds, confess your sins each other and pray for each other. I wonder if we do that much anymore. Love one another deeply from the heart. That is like the deepest part of like, like from the very center of yourself, you love one another. Live in harmony with one another. I take all that collectively and I just stand back and so look, I go, my walk with Jesus is deeply impacted by how, how well I do life with my brothers and sisters in Christ. They are connected in my mind and I believe personally that the church is God's purposeful plan to bring all of this together. Where else in this world can all of this come together and actually happen outside the church? Where else can you find a group of people who have nothing in common sitting in this room today? Where else are you gonna find that? God designed us to need each other. The church is the perfect setup for that. And as we have brainstormed and considered and thought about how we can fulfill these things with one another, we just come back to life groups. Not to bang that drum again, but a life group, in case you don't know, is a small group of people from the church here, usually eight to 12 people, usually meeting somebody's home and uh, uh, for the purpose of studying God's word, praying together, holding each other up, fellowshipping, caring for one another, literally being the church together, fulfilling the very things that the Apostle Paul says. Let us hold on, let's draw near to God. Let us spur one another on. Let us hold on to hope. These things happen inside of a life group. And I'll tell you, I love it when I hear stories from our church family of how their walk with Jesus has been so greatly impacted by the life group that they find themselves in. So I just boil it down. I just think we're a lot better together than we are apart. And so when we talk about this word grow, spiritual growth, it's all of this stuff. And I believe a great way to live it out is in a life group. Now also as I study scripture, as I think about the ministry of Jesus, and maybe you've never thought about it like this before, and I'm happy to share with you for the first time. Maybe you have thought about this before. But this idea was modeled by Jesus. You realize that Jesus invested his life into a small group of people. All of it. Jesus did not walk this road alone. I mean, he had other people. He began his ministry by choosing 12 disciples. In case you don't know their names, let me rattle them off for you. Matthew 10, 2 through 4. These are the names of the 12 apostles. First, Simon, who is called Peter, and his brother Andrew. James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John. Philip and Bartholomew. Thomas and Matthew, the tax collector. James, the son of Alphaeus and Thaddeus. Simon, the zealot, and Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him. This was Jesus' small group. 
These are the people he personally invested two to three years of his life with. Twelve men who during those two to three years deeply loved one another. They had challenges. They had arguments. They had fights. But they served the Lord. They grew a lot. And they fell in love with Jesus. Pretty awesome. Even within this group of twelve, there was a smaller group even within made up of three people. Peter, James, and John. And there seems to even be a closer relationship in there. So I see all this in the New Testament. I see what Jesus modeled for us. And it all comes back to as we consider and think about how we want to be intentional in our discipleship. Small groups, life groups, what we call them, make a lot of sense. And I also think about not only was that the backbone of Jesus's ministry, but small groups was also the backbone of the early church. The the earliest church in the book of Acts was dependent upon smaller groups of people. These, it's not to say they didn't have large gatherings, but to live out what was happening in the book of Acts, it was in smaller groups of people. It says in Acts 2.42, they devoted themselves, that's these earliest Christians, to the apostles' teaching, which was the apostles, or the disciples rather, teaching the church everything that Jesus had told them. They devoted that to fellowship, It's that word koinonia. It's not just a handshake and a donut on Sunday. This was like doing life together. The breaking of bread is the Lord's Supper, remembering Christ's sacrifice, and prayer. That's that's what they did. And they did it in smaller groups of people. You know, it was done in people's homes. So these four things were a very, very big deal. It goes on to say in verse 44, all the believers were together. They had everything in common. They were sharing, selling their possessions and goods they gave to anyone at need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple course. They broke bread in their homes, ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. So the church got started with this understanding, we can't go alone, we gotta do it together. And it was built into the very fabric of the early church. I I like what Rick Warren said years ago about the church. I love his description. I've never forgotten it. He said this, the church is not a building. Now you understand that, right? Now we say that and we have two buildings and I love these two buildings. But these two buildings can be blown by a tornado all the way down. I hope that doesn't happen. But they can be taken away tomorrow and we would still be the church. Church is not a building. We don't identify with our address. That's not how we, we identify with our relationship with Jesus. So I like his definition. Church is not a building and it's not an institution and it's not an organization and it's not a club. He says it's a family. And I do believe that that is an accurate description of the body of Christ. We are a family. And then he goes on to say, a lot of people say, well, I'm going to church as if church is a place we go. I say that every day. I'm heading to the church. I'll see you at the church. And we say it too. You said it today. I'm going to church. You going to church? We're going to church. And that's normal language. I get it. Don't stop saying that. But I like his definition. It's not a place you go. Church is a family that you belong to. That's what we are. He said that's a big difference. It's more than a building It's more than a service. It's a family you belong to. Why can it be that? It's because we're meant to do it together. We're not created to be alone. It would be very, very difficult to live out the teachings of the New Testament without the community of other believers. Let me share a few more scriptures with you that will be done, but think about this. Proverbs 27, 17 says, as iron sharpens iron, so one man sharpens another. Got to be together. 2 Peter 2, 17, love the brotherhood of believers. I don't believe that loving the brotherhood, the church, I don't believe that happens at a distance. I believe that happens in close proximity. 1 Peter 4, 8, above all, love each other deeply because love covers over a multitude of sins. Nothing else, love does. Jesus' death on the cross, its basis was love. God so loved the world that he gave. 
1 Peter 4, 9, offer hospitality to one another. Galatians 6, 2, carry each other's burdens. And in this way, you fulfill the law of Christ. Hebrews 10, 25, let us not give up. Meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but let us consider, or excuse me, encourage one another. Bottom line is, and I hope you take this away from this message, we're just better together and it'd be very hard to live out this Christian life without the community of believers. So here's what I wanna ask you to do. If you are not in a life group, I would like for you to pray and consider joining one. And if you're ready to jump into one right now, you can do it today. You can walk out into that lobby. We've got plenty of other life groups ready to go. Jump in. And if you can't find one, I can promise you this. Pastor Cody will work tirelessly, tirelessly, it's a tough one for an Okie like me, to get you in a life group. And let me just say this. If you can't find a life group, it could very well be because God is saying, I don't want you in a life group. I want you to lead a life group. So I really want you to consider that. God may be putting it on your heart to lead one. And we're going to be raising up groups all the time. I'm just telling you that uh, we can't make you get in a life group. Never force anybody to do anything. But what we can do is do everything we know how to do to create opportunities. And if God leads you to one, you feel inspired to go in one, we want to help you find a life group. Uh, if you're not in one, let's get in one. If you are in a life group already, praise God. You're going to have some conversations with people out here today, and maybe they're not. Maybe God's putting you in their path for you to encourage them, love them, and help them see the great benefit of it. So friends, here's what we want to see happen with everybody in our church, everybody who calls New Life home. We want you to, what's the first word, G? Gather. Come to church just like you did right today. Worship the Lord. Remember Christ's sacrifice. Be in God's word. Be encouraged by being with the church. Rub shoulders with one another. Share some laughs. Enjoy the church. We want you to grow. What do we mean by grow? Spiritual growth. How do we intentionally, on purpose, try to do that around here? Through life groups. Is that the only way to grow? Of course not. But it's one way that we really try hard to put a lot of energy in. And then how else do we do it? The third word is we're going to go. And you come back next week. <laughs> because God's put some things on my heart to share with all of you, and um, I don't want you to miss it. Let me pray for you. Dear God, we just thank you that we could be here this evening. Lord, I, as I study scripture and others have, it just seems obvious that, that we weren't meant to, to go through our Christian lives all by ourselves. So Lord, I, I wanna pray for anybody in this room right now that is dealing with any level of loneliness in their life. I pray God that today, through your Holy Spirit, you would just, just cover them over with encouragement. And I would pray, Lord, that you would begin to pull, that, that the church family would start to pull them back into community. And Lord, I don't always understand how you do what you do, but I just know, Lord, we weren't meant to go through this world alone and that, Lord, the church of, of anything in the world should be on the front lines combating loneliness. Lord, I do know it's a great epidemic in our world today. So, Lord, I would pray somehow, some way, through a life group, through a relationship, through another brother, sister in Christ, Lord, that if anybody in our church family is just lonely, that, Lord, you would orchestrate that change. That, Lord, you would bring a special person into their life. And that would be a, the beginning, the start of something very wonderful and powerful in their walk with Jesus. So Lord, I, I pray for that specifically today. Lord, I pray that as we navigate this world, that you help us see that we need one another to do it. So Lord, help us individually to approach you with clean hearts and clean hands, that Lord, we live holy and pure lives, that Lord, we would never lose sight of the hope we have of your return, and that Lord, we would always be on the lookout 
very intentionally and on purpose of how we can spur one another on love and encouragement, good deeds, and to be the church. Lord, I pray these things happen in our church family and happen well. Lord, most importantly today, we just give you praise on high for loving us and how your love by sending your son Jesus Christ this world to die on the cross has covered over a multitude of sins, our sins. And that Lord, you raised back to life on the third day, conquering sin and death forever. So Lord, we celebrate that today. We never lose sight that we were lost at one point in our lives, but now we're found and we'll forever praise you for it. So Lord, I thank you for that we could be here today to be the church. And I pray you'd help us take these things to heart. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Hey, let's stand to our feet, church. Let's sing this last song with great enthusiasm. And as always, once you know some of our leaders will be down here at the front. If you just want some prayer today, going through something, we want to pray with you. If you want to talk about your walk with Jesus, you want to get baptized, you, what, what is the Lord stirring in your heart today? We're here to visit with you. Let's do some real ministry with God. So when we're done singing, you just come on up here. We'd love to do some ministry today. Yeah.
Christ. We will never be alone with that if we're always in his presence. Amen. You guys go. Have a blessed evening.